Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone, welcome back to Talking Tudors, episode 38. I'm your host, Natalie Gruniger. As always, a huge thank you to the fabulous patrons who continue to support this podcast. I'm so very grateful for each and every one of you. A full list of patrons is available on my website under the Patrons tab. If you love Talking Tudors and would like to show your appreciation and support the work I do, just click on the Be My Patron on Podbean badge on the homepage of my website, www.onthetudors.com tutortrail.com or click on the be a patron button on the podbean app join the talking tutors patron family and you'll be automatically entered into our patron only monthly giveaways june's prize is a copy of owen book one of the tutor trilogy by tony richards a huge thank you to tony for sponsoring this wonderful prize check out his other great books at tonyriches.com Now, on to today's episode. I'm thrilled that joining me on the show to talk about Mary the First is Melita Thomas. Melita is the co-founder and editor of Tudor Times, a repository of information about Tudors and Stuarts in the period 1485 to 1625. You'll find this website at www.tudortimes.co.uk. Melita has loved history since being mesmerised by the BBC productions of The Six Wives of Henry VIII and Elizabeth Thou when she was a little girl. After that, she read everything she could get her hands on about this most fascinating of dynasties. Captivated by the story of the Lady Mary galloping to Framlingham to set up her standard and fight for her rights, Melita began her first book about the Queen when she was nine, the manuscripts probably still in the attic. While still pursuing a career in business, Melita took a course on writing biography, which led her and her business partner to the idea for the Tudor Times, and gave her the inspiration to begin writing about Mary again. The King's Pearl, Henry VIII and his daughter Mary was her first book. Her next book, The House of Grey, Friends and Foes of Kings, is a study of the Grey family, Lady Jane Grey's predecessors, and will be published in September 2019. My conversation with Melita straight after this short musical break, courtesy of guitarist John Sales. Welcome to Talking Tudors, Melita. How are you? Hello, Natalie. I'm very well, thank you. And thanks very much for inviting me to take part. Yes, I'm really looking forward to chatting. Me too. Thank you very much. Now, maybe let's begin by you just telling us a little bit about yourself and your background. Uh, well, I'm not a historian by background, but I've always been fascinated by history generally and Tudor history in particular. And about five years ago now, I um, set up uh, 
Tudor times along with a colleague who's equally interested in history and we've spent a very enjoyable five years delving further and further and further into the Tudor and Stuart period and yes getting to see all the places that I dreamed of visiting when I was a little girl so it's been great. Fabulous and, and I love I love the Tudor Times website by the way. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah I'm actually I've moved now into writing books as well so I'm on, I've just sent in my second one to the publisher and I'm looking to expand my historical knowledge by going back to university in the autumn to do a master's. Fantastic. It's mm. really exciting news, isn't it? So Melita, mm. what what sparked your interest in the Tudors specifically? Uh, I think like many people of my generation, it was the BBC series, uh, The Six Wives of Henry VIII with Keith Michelle right, yeah. and Glenda Jackson as Elizabeth R. I think, I think those two series have won an awful lot of Tudor fans over the last 40 or 50 years. They were marvellous. Absolutely. I love those ones. Now, you, yeah. you mentioned your... Um, oh, sorry, I interrupted you there. So basically, it was that show and then you kind of began researching and, and looking into things. Yes, I think like most people then, you know, I was really charmed by Elizabeth and the thought of her as, you know, when she was about 13, um, the whole Seymour thing, of course, caught, caught a young girl's attention. But then I looked into it more and I read the books by Hilda Lewis about Mary I, I mean, Hilda Lewis isn't much read these days, but she was a very good historical fiction writer. And I absolutely begged my mother to buy me these books, even though they were far too old for me, probably. <laughs> and she finally gave in. And so I read about Mary and suddenly realized that all the concentration on Elizabeth was very... Um, very unfair in a way and the two were always pitted against each other and you know Elizabeth was good Mary was bad Elizabeth was sensible Mary was a fanatic mm -hmm. Elizabeth was an intellectual powerhouse Mary was an ignorant innocent and it just it just didn't seem to actually add up when you looked at the facts of Mary's life so uh, without wishing in any way to um, undermine the brilliance of Elizabeth Mary was brilliant in a different way and in her own way and I felt she deserves a bit more of a fair hearing really. Okay well that I wanted to ask you about your biography because you've written an excellent book about Mary the first which is called The King's Pearl Henry the eighth and his daughter Mary and I guess I wanted to ask you what drew you to her story so do you want to go into that a little bit more? Yes it's as I say it's this sort of black and whiteness about Mary I mean she was she had a hard life in lots of ways, but in other ways, she had a very good life. She had um, a happy early childhood. So th th this picture that people have of Mary is either that she was a bloody fanatic, you know, mm -hmm. drinking the drinking the blood of Protestants. And, I, you know, I'm not I wouldn't underestimate the, the, the horrors of religious persecution. Uh, yeah. So, you know, don't don't get me wrong on that. Although, of course, they, they, they were all at it. She, she certainly wasn't the only one. Um, but then the idea that she was sort of, at the same time as she was this fanatical persecutor, she was also uh, completely dominated by her husband and that she'd been neglected and uh, ill-treated by Henry and that she was sort of this pathetic downcast figure who, you know, spent her time weeping and praying. But when you look at what she did, she was the only woman who the only person during the Tudor period who managed to overturn uh, the, the will of central government. She stood up for her rights as a girl. At, at the age of 17, she defied Henry. She defied Cromwell. She defied Anne Boleyn. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not the mark of, a, a, of somebody with no backbone. So I wanted to understand a bit more about the truth rather than the, the stereotypes, I suppose. And I found that she was... Yes, a different person from how she's stereotyped. You know, in, in some ways, I liked her more after reading and learning more about her, but in some ways, I liked her less. Right. She, <laughs> she wasn't perhaps quite as honest as I had thought her. You know, I had this vision of her as a very straightforward, straight-talking sort of woman, but actually, you realise she was quite as politically devious as any of the mm. rest of them. Uh, so a very much more complex and nuanced person but uh, she, she seems to have had the gift of friendship as well she had a lot of friends possibly um, again you know even I'm drawn into sort of making comparisons with Elizabeth which isn't fair but Mary seems to have had the gift of friendship with other women perhaps perhaps more than her sister did yeah. uh, 
can see in her youth that she she had a lot of friends that she visited and sent presents to and they sent presents to her and yeah she was also a lot more fun uh, she was her overriding characteristic uh, I think both personally and politically which again doesn't really come out in standard views of her is that she was a gambler right she okay. was she was a risk taker if if you look at the risk she took in 1553, if you look at the risk she took in 1554 when in Wyatt's rebellion she went down to the city of London and exposed herself to danger. You know Henry hadn't done that. The Pilgrimage of Grace he he skulked about at, at Windsor away from any possible rebels, but she she gambled very heavily in the conventional sense. I mean they they all did. Mm. Um, just were great gamblers but mary had a had a particularly bad habit i mean on one occasion she lost 10 pounds in a single bet to her doctor <laughs> wow yeah, I mean, that is an incredible amount of money and she was also um she loved fine clothes and she loved jewelry and she loved um dancing i mean her, her little brother edward complained to catherine parr that mary danced too much so it was a lot more physical and fun and then you know as a girl I mean things went 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 awry later but uh, yeah she, she was a more well-rounded character than, than I had known before. Well you're definitely painting a very different picture of I think the Mary we all you know that comes to mind when we hear the name Mary mm. the first so that's that's great. Now what's wonderful I think Malita about your book is that you focus a lot on on Mary's life before she becomes queen, a period that is largely overlooked in other accounts of her life. Um, so could could you talk to us a little bit about Mary's actual education and upbringing? Yeah, surely. Um, Mary's, both Mary's parents were very intellectual. Henry and Catherine in their, their young days together in the 1510s and 1520s, they were surrounded by the humanists of, of that generation. There was Erasmus, of course, Sir Thomas More, Dr. Lineker, who was one of the first men in Western Europe to study ancient Greek. He studied in Florence uh, alongside possibly Lorenzo de' Medici. And it was this Dr. Lineker that was originally asked to come up with a scheme for Mary's education. Uh, he possibly didn't actually teach her himself because he he died not long after he was uh, asked to take the role on. But he did create a a book, uh, a Latin grammar, Rudimenta Grammatica, which was based on lessons designed for Mary. Then the other great humanist who was welcome at the court of Henry and Catherine was Juan Luis Vives. I think that's the correct pronunciation. Mm -hmm. He was a Spanish humanist, but he. He'd been expelled from Spain from, for having Jewish heritage. And he spent much of his time at the University of Leuven in, in the Low Countries. Uh, and then he came to England as reader in Greek, Latin and rhetoric at Wolsey's New College. And Catherine asked him to be involved in Mary's education. And he wrote three books, that, three treatises about, about education that were important in Mary's education. One was the um, uh, the education of a Christian woman, mm -hmm. which, uh, I mean, it was wildly misogynistic by our standards because the whole thing was about how important it was for women to be chaste and helpmates to their husbands and things. But it was very groundbreaking in that it, dis it, it agreed that women were intellectually potentially the equal of men and that they deserved to be educated. The, the purpose of education was to fit them to be better wives and mothers, but you know, the idea that women couldn't be educated or that they were intellectually inferior, he, he completely disagreed with. So Mary had the the humanist education of the 1520s. She was a very fine Latinist. Mm -hmm. uh, later in the 1540s, she took part in the translation that was arranged by Catherine Parr of the paraphrases on the Gospels by Erasmus. And Mary translated most of the section on St. John. Uh, the other translators were, were, so far as we know, all men, no, though one of them's anonymous. Uh, you know, she wouldn't have been doing that sort of work had she not been, you know, very accomplished at it. Uh, she spoke French. She certainly undertook, understood Italian and Spanish. It's not clear whether she learnt Greek. She may have done. Uh, there's a couple of later references, but uh, it's not as certain as that Edward and Elizabeth did. Uh, she was a very fine musician. All the Tudors were, were great musicians, but she particularly talented with the lute and the virginals. And as I mentioned before, she was a great dancer. The ambassadors used to comment on her on her skill. Uh, nothing said about her singing, though, so we okay. can assume that she wasn't, wasn't too good on that front. <laughs> 
Yeah, so so she had, you know, the, a top class education. Uh, and as she got a bit older, uh, Vives came up with another uh, set of in uh, of reading materials and so forth that concentrated more on history and philosophy and perhaps were leaning more towards education of her as a potential queen queen in her own right as opposed to the initial view that she would be a consort probably to her cousin the emperor so uh yeah nothing wrong with mary's education no absolutely not i'm just yeah I, it always amazes me when i hear about their education actually i think i wonder how i'd go having to learn all the, all those languages and all that stuff goodness gracious amazing and so young <laughs> and so young yeah i just think that's it's quite a, it's just amazing really um so melita tell us about some of the marriage negotiations that took place in mary's childhood and her adolescence she had a long string of betrothals. The first one was when she was um, coming up towards three years old, two and a half to three. And it was to the, the Dauphin of France, the son of Francois and Claude of, of France. Mm. And he was even younger than she was. So they were betrothed by proxy in uh, October of 1518. And Mary actually took part in the ceremony. She was wearing a little um, cloth of gold dress and a black velvet hood. And she, there was a massive diamond that was that was put on her little finger, uh, and according to the audience, uh, amongst him was the Venetian ambassador. She enchanted them all by asking the rather elderly admiral of France, who was the proxy for the little dauphin, if he were the dauphin, because if he was, she wanted to kiss him. <laughs> so you can imagine everybody cooing over that one. Um, so that was the first one, and that lasted officially for about four years. Then in 1522, uh, Henry and Francis I fell out and she was betrothed to her cousin, the Emperor Charles V. And there wasn't a betrothal ceremony such as she'd gone through with the Dauphin, but there was a treaty, the Treaty of Windsor. And that agreed that when she was 12, she would uh, go off to Spain or to the Low Countries, wherever he happened to be at the time, marry, the, marry Charles and become Empress. Now, for both of these betrothals, Henry had had to admit that Mary was his heir, and he wasn't terribly keen on admitting that because he was still hoping that a son would come along. But, mm. you know, as things stood, she was legally his heir, so that was the that was the deal. Mary would become empress, England would join the empire, and Henry, instead of having a son of his own, he could look forward to having a grandson who was emperor, which is you know, not a bad consolation mm. prize, but he wasn't thrilled about that. Then in 1526, although um, Charles, or 1525, Charles wanted the marriage to take place immediately, but Mary was only nine, and Henry said, no, can't do that. And there was a couple of reasons for that. He still had no male heir, so Mary was still his heir. And if he sent her off to Spain at the age of nine, she was too young to marry, and there was nothing to stop Charles holding her hostage so you know it was clearly an impossible situation and he couldn't let her marry he didn't even want her to marry at the legal age of 12 uh, because he didn't like uh, early marriage for girls the whole family were very conscious of Margaret Beaufort's yes, um, yeah. troubles in, in, in having married too young and you know I think Henry, Henry was genuinely not not happy at the thought of his daughter um, being subjected to, to marriage too early I mean mm -hmm. he, he loved uh, so that fell through. Charles jilted her and married their mutual cousin, Isabel of Portugal, who had a stunning dowry of a million ducats. Ooh. So, you know, was, uh, yeah. <laughs> and she was also the same age as him. So it was it was a better match. And eventually Mary married their son. So following that, she was then betrothed to Francis I of France, the father of her first fiance yes. uh, yeah I and mean, you can't imagine that anybody thought that was very pleasant because he was as old as her father and you know had a very nasty disease to put mm. it no further <laughs> yep yep or the alternative was that she might marry the second son henry of orleans who later married catherine de medici uh, uh so but it was decided that she would marry francis however that didn't come off because Francis had to marry uh, the emperor's sister as part of the, uh, uh, the the ladies' piece of 1532. So Mary was sort of back on the shelf. Then there was talk of her marrying um, the uh, Duke of Cleves' son, Wilhelm of Cleves, who uh, Henry mar later married his sister, Anne. Then there was a the thought that she might marry Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey. That was an idea apparently promoted by Anne Boleyn initially. 
Uh, to keep Mary sort of, this was in the early 1530s, to keep Mary sort of tied into the Howard family. But I think uh, Norfolk, Anne's uncle, thought that this was all far too risky. So he, he, he got Henry Surrey married off quickly to somebody else. Then later, during the period when Anne was queen, there were still negotiations with uh, sort of France, who wanted Mary as, as a bride, but uh, Henry wasn't going to have that. He he wanted um, this. We'll come on to it, but but that so so there was nothing really happening in that period. Right. Later, there were quite there were few few others. There was Don Lewis of Portugal, and <laughs> most interesting of all, perhaps the Voivod of Transylvania. Oh, that sounds interesting. <laughs> yeah, I know the Bride of Dracula. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, uh, and the only one she, the only other one she met, she met Charles. She met Philip of Bavaria, who um, seemed to quite like her. Sent her a diamond cross and even kissed her. Uh, sort of one little bit of romance in in Mary's youth, perhaps. <laughs> Goodness, there were a lot of negotiations. I didn't realise yes. there were quite that many. But I think my favourite one is the Transylvania one. Thank you, Melita. I didn't know about that. That's yeah. really interesting. Now, when people sort of think about Mary and her father Henry, we often focus on their relationship you know, when after the whole issue with Anne and Catherine and all that. So what was Mary's relationship with her father like in the years before he sought to annul his marriage to Catherine of Aragon? Henry doted on Mary. I mean, he loved all his children. As long as they obeyed him, he was yes. a very affectionate father. But he doted on Mary and he knew Mary the best because she spent a lot of time with her parents as a little girl. He would carry her about. He'd show her off to the ambassadors. He'd make her dance and, and play the virginals for them and answer them in Italian or French or whatever. So he liked to show her off. Uh, he would dance with her in masks. And there was one uh, occasion when he he took off her headdress to show them all her beautiful, long, golden hair. Uh, so so he, he, he loved his little girl. Then, of course, so, so he, had a he had a personal relationship with her. And then there was the, the sort of political relationship, whether she was his heir or not, which he was much less comfortable with. Um, so when um, the, the annulment proceedings began, yes. to begin with, Mary didn't, didn't suffer at all. Uh, she was still referred to as Princess of Wales. She was still um, treated as his heir, his daughter. Um, he still tried to see her, but Anne wasn't terribly keen on that because, well, you know, fathers and their daughters, he, he, I suppose she didn't want his affection for Mary to undermine his determination to, to have his marriage to Catherine annulled. Um, and he was genuinely, I think, surprised and shocked when... And Mary decided to support Catherine because right. I think Henry had just assumed that you know even if Mary didn't like being set aside, that she would just obey him. Mm. Um, I, I think the uh, when she, you know, he sent a message saying ha having treated her as Princess of Wales and uh, she had her own houses and her own staff and you know she gets a message through her chamberlain that suddenly she's no longer a princess and she was to send her jewels back and go and be a servant in her half sister's household and Mary. Mary couldn't believe her ears, literally. Mm. And she she sent a message back to her father saying, you know, you, you don't really mean this, do you? I, I, there must be some mistake. And Henry couldn't believe his ears that his daughter had questioned his will. Yes, yeah. And, you know, so, but he was, he was very upset by it and he was much more, um, you know, other people could, if other people criticised her, he'd get angry with them and he would, um, you know, tears would well up in his eyes. But at the same time, he was absolutely raging against her hmm. and called her his worst enemy and stamped his foot and, you know, all the, because if a king couldn't make his daughter obey him, then it didn't, didn't well, look very good exactly. on the kingship front, did it? <laughs> exactly. So, mm. very mixed. Then, after Anne's demise, he, you know, Mary was forced into submission. Um, I think possibly seeing seeing what had happened to Anne did perhaps concentrate her mind. Um, yes, I think so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and made her realise that, you know, there were, whether Henry would have executed his daughter, I mean, who knows, but, you know, he executed his wife. Exactly, I, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, 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 you, you can't even imagine such a situation, but, um, you know, so much pressure was put on her at that point that she did give in. And he was, he couldn't have been more delighted. Mm. So she was welcomed back to court. She was showered with gifts and jewels again. And 
occasionally he'd be a bit suspicious that she hadn't really meant it, but he chose to believe her assurances that she'd accepted the annulment, didn't press her too far on it after, you know, after she'd repeated herself a couple of times. And then for the next 10 years of his life, the rest of his life, uh, Mary spent a good deal of time at the court and, um, you know, they, they resurrected their relationship. Yeah, that's interesting. Now, I want to ask you something, Melita, because normally when when people talk about just going back a little bit to, you know, when Anne Boleyn is still alive and, and her relationship with Henry and when she's queen, you know, people normally lay the blame of, I suppose we can call it the harsh treatment of Mary at Anne's sort of doorstep and, you know, want to blame her for everything. But, um, I, and I'm, we won't go into this in too much detail, but I just want to know, do you think that's a fair assessment or do you think that obviously Henry has something to answer for here, being her father and the king? And I, I know that he must have just been so outraged that she just did not, you know, submit to his will and do as he said. What do you think about that? Yeah, Henry, for everything that happened in Henry's reign, he, he has to take ultimate responsibility. Yes. Um I think that I think there was, uh, as well as the, the political, I think there was a personality clash between Anne and Mary, mm. um, and I think it probably it probably stemmed from the late late fifteen twenties. If Mary, you know, sort of fifteen twenty eight, fifteen twenty nine, Mary was twelve thirteen. Yes, but yeah. Anne was Anne was still a servant in her mother's household, and Mary probably. Um, may have treated her, you, you know, with... I can imagine a 13 or 14-year-old girl treating her father's mistress um, who Absolutely. was you know, in a subservient mm. position, you know, fairly fairly chillily, shall we say. Yes, yeah. So, I mean, I don't have any evidence of that, but I can imagine that that was the case. And then Anne, uh, Anne I think, did have quite a um, a petty streak, I think. I, 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 I you know and she she was in frightened and in a difficult position herself and had had to fight for her corner but you know one or two of the actions uh, that that she took um against uh, against Catherine and Mary i think were a bit small minded like asking for the christening cloth and things mm. um so i would say there was a personality clash and that that made mary you know even de- more determined she was never going to curtsy to her mother's her mother's lady in waiting um but, I mean, it was Henry's policy. Henry's policy was not initially that Mary should be illegitimate. Yeah. He hoped to keep her legitimate even if the marriage were annulled because as born in good faith, you know, Mary could remain a legitimate princess. Once Elizabeth was born, it was all a bit different. So Mary had to be demoted. I think, you know, some of the things that Anne said, whether or not, you know, that she'd, she'd have Mary's ears boxed, mm. uh, yeah, so so I think Henry was responsible for the policy. I think Anne, you know, wasn't wasn't necessarily the kindest or gentlest of women, and I think there was probably a bit of a personality clash as well. So um, yeah, okay. It, both so. both women were fighting for their corner. They certainly were, and they weren't shrinking violets, were they? So that's always no. going to be a clash of <laughs> yeah, clash of yeah. personalities. So did, let's talk about Mary and her um, half brother and half sister. So Edward and Elizabeth. Did they spend much time together? Yes, certainly they did in the uh, early, in their, the early youth of the younger children. I mean, obviously Mary spent uh, the th- years 1533 to 1536 in, in Elizabeth's household as a, yes. as a sort of servient. But she didn't hold it against Elizabeth. Um, not long after she'd been reconciled with Henry, within weeks, in fact, she wrote to Henry saying what a lovely little girl Elizabeth was and oh. she was sure that Henry would, um, you know, take great joy in her, which... You know, which does show a real kindness actually to her little sister, because she didn't she didn't blame Elizabeth, uh, but she was very attached to Edward. She was his godmother and visited him very regularly. I mean, Elizabeth and Edward were often together, and Mary probably spent more time with Edward than any other adult in his family. And he, a bit later, he he would write to her his little Latin letters, <laughs> and the ones he wrote to his father and to Catherine Parr were very formal and, you know, probably helped by his tutor. But it looks like the ones he wrote to Mary, perhaps he'd done himself because they were more, more sort of childlike. And he, in one he wrote to her and he compared her with his, his best clothes. Oh. And he said, even, even though he didn't wear his favourite clothes all the time, it didn't mean he didn't love them best. Oh. And just because he didn't write to Mary all the time, didn't mean he didn't love her the best. So That's was, sweet. That yeah, makes Edward more human as well, doesn't it? <laughs> 
start. I and mean, there he was, eight years old. And of course, you know, when he became king, this was all squeezed out mm-hmm. of him, this, yeah. this love for his sisters. Uh, so as far as Elizabeth was concerned, I think, you know, when she was a young girl, Mary was fond of her. She gave her a lot of presents and she even gave her money for gambling. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I know you just can't imagine it, can you? Yeah. Um, I wonder if... I, but they were very unlike as characters, hmm. and I think as they as uh, Elizabeth grew, grew older, they 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 just didn't gel particularly as personalities. Um, I think there may have been some jealousy, perhaps, around Catherine Parr. I mean, Mary and Catherine were close friends. Elizabeth generally did not like Catherine's other friends. Uh, you know, she couldn't stand Catherine Willoughby, for example. So. Uh, I think because Elizabeth was so fond of Catherine Parr, she kind of liked to keep her to herself a bit. And I think I think there may have been a bit of jealousy there. Um, so, yeah, the, the, once, once Elizabeth was more than a child, the, 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 the relationship wasn't brilliant. But no, Mary and Edward um, were very attached. OK, and who would you say were some of the, the most influential people in Mary's life? And how did they, they shape the woman and the queen that, that she'd later become? Well, her parents were clearly the most influential. I think Catherine, as a as an example of um, standing up for what you believe in and being absolutely rigid to your principles. Yes. And I don't know that um, Catherine ever talked about her own mother, Isabella, but I'm sure she did. So I can't evidence it mm. but i'm quite sure that catherine told uh, mary plenty about what it was like to be a, a, a reigning queen and that mary would have been sort of influenced from beyond the grave by her grandmother both henry and catherine throughout the whole divorce thing they were adamant they were acting according to their conscience so mary was taught by both parents that to be true to your conscience you know however convenient it appears to us to have been for both <laughs> both her parents you know as a concept that was very strong uh probably margaret salisbury her governess yes again a lady of very um sort of traditional conservative belief uh so i think she was probably quite a strong influence uh later well catherine parr they were they were close friends but they were of the same age so it was not so much an influence as just a, a you know somebody that that she had a good relationship with uh she was very strongly influenced by her cousin, the emperor, um, put much more faith in him than he actually deserved. Um, but she, she did look up to him. Uh, I think perhaps also Thomas More and John Fisher. Mm-hmm. She saw them hold out against uh, Henry's, you know, the acts of supremacy. She, in the end, she couldn't do it. She, she did give in. But, you know, there were a lot of very strong characters for her to look up to. Yeah, definitely. Now, over the centuries, you know, popular representations of Mary, and you've touched on some of these, have included Mary the religious fanatic and and bloody tyrant and Mary the hopeless and isolated victim, you know, neglected by her father and later abandoned by her husband. Um, And you've talked a little bit about the Mary that you've encountered in your research, but I'd love to hear a little bit more. What what was she really like and what what did the contemporaries think of her, her contemporaries? That is a difficult question to answer up mm. until up until um she became queen she was extremely popular so right, i mean okay. she came to, she came to the throne on a wave of of public popularity during her reign um obviously wyatt's rebellion was was defeated uh, it's and certainly to begin with she was considered to be sort of very um compassionate and merciful and she hadn't um you know executed people wholesale after northumberland's um attempted coup it all t- comes down to who wrote about her reign after she was dead yes yeah and when she died england was still largely catholic the protestant ascendancy of elizabeth's reign started with a very small group of high-ranking um gentry and nobles who'd who'd sort of come to power in uh, under somerset and northumberland and who ensured that elizabeth came to the throne but they were they were quite a small group but of course over time there because they were the government that you know their their influence grew and and england gradually changed from a catholic to a protestant country by the end of elizabeth's reign and of course they were the ones who wrote the history um you know john fox is the the byword for the you know in his book of acts and martyrs and he refers to the bloody days of queen mary right okay. although actually he doesn't necessarily uh, 
paint Mary as particularly um, strongly a persecutor. He, he, he reserves most of his ire for Bonner, Edmund Bonner. Mm -hmm. So that's where the word bloody first comes from. Uh, so, and Elizabeth... You know, Elizabeth didn't like praise of Mary at at Mary's funeral oration. Um, she 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 had the bishop um, sent off to jail because he oh. was too nice about Mary and not nice enough about Elizabeth. Oh dear. Um, yes, yes. So, uh, so it is hard to at the time. Um, you know, she certainly had. She was certainly uh, uh, her personal courage and and um, resilience. I think were very much remarked on. And there's a little throwaway line that I've come across, and I haven't. I, you know, I want to go further in Mary's life. I've sort of finished in 1547. But towards the end of her reign, um, France, of course, uh, Calais was lost. Yes. But there's a letter where one minister is saying to the other, the Queen uh, thinks that if we campaign again next season, she will take the field herself. Right, OK. So she, you know, she could, you, you know, again, emulating Isabella, That's which, right, of course, yeah. Elizabeth yeah, where where her reputation fell in her own time was was the loss of France mm -hmm. or the loss of Calais. Of course, the marriage to Philip, if it had gone as Mary gambled again, she gambled that she and Philip would have a child. Now, if they'd had a child, it was a great treaty because that child would have inherited the Netherlands and Burgundy and and Philip's territories there, which would have been fantastic because mm -hmm. that was England's greatest trading partner. You know, it would have been a huge coup for England. And the war with France, um, you, you know, to begin with, the Anglo-Spanish troops did very well. Uh, the Battle of St. Quentin, Philip was too nervous and he didn't march on Paris. He could have marched on Paris. If he'd won a chunk of France back for England, Mary would be the greatest queen we'd ever had. Yeah. But he didn't. So, uh, yeah, sorry, I've digressed a bit. No, but that's he, the, okay, yeah. Paris, element of the reputation as Bloody Mary crops up about a century later okay. in the 1680s mm -hmm. uh, when James II, uh, who, who was a Catholic, um, came to the throne. And there was a lot of complaints and, you know, we'll be back to the days of Bloody Mary if we if we allow James to, to take the throne as a Catholic. So that's where a lot of the propaganda was really um, became really rife after her death quite a long time. And it just persisted since then, hasn't it? It hasn't really. It has, <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, out of all the misconceptions that exist about Mary, what do you think is one of the most persistent? You've done a lot of research. You know, you, you're active on social media as well. What, what do you think is one of the most sort of persistent misconceptions that you hear about Mary the First? I think, well, I mean, the, the, there's, there's two things I'd sort of like to correct the record on. One is yeah. that, as I mentioned before, she, she was a lot more fun than you, you yes. might have. If yeah, I love that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the second one actually is about her health. Yes. Now, okay. Mary had poor health, no doubt about that. Or she had poor health from the age of about 13 or 14. And it's been leapt on that this was all gynecological. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at the evidence of the time and... You know, people read back from her having a phantom pregnancy, and which obviously is a deeply, deeply traumatic thing for, for anybody to experience. Uh, she had one, possibly two phantom pregnancies. So she clearly had some sort of gynecological issues then, although phantom pregnancy is, is psychological. Yes, yeah. um, but it, in her teenage years, um, she, had, she, she was ill frequently. And there is one ambassador's report that suggests that this was to do with um, uh, menstruation. Mm -hmm. And this has been leapt on by everybody ever since that she had terrible gynecological problems. Now, it's possible that she did, but when you read the descriptions of her illness, they don't seem to be gynecological. Right. Yes, she, she had severe stomach pains, but she would vomit, she couldn't eat. She On one occasion, she was in almost a, a, a narcotic coma for several days. Uh, it was very seasonal. She became much iller in the winter than in the summer. A lot of these things sound um, possibly gastric, very bad gastric issues. She had pains in her side. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the, the sort of vomiting, the inability to eat, the, uh, the headaches and the, the sort of, you know, the, they could all be stress. Yes. Um, 
a lot of the quite a lot of this the symptoms relate to um you know stress symptoms vomiting and 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 that sort of thing mm. um so i'm not saying they weren't gynecological but it's it's a massive assumption that people make because she was a woman and she wasn't well it had to be her womb basically yes yes it's a big leap uh, isn't it from it's from a those big leap up. and it's something mm. that you know I mean, that was one of the underpinning things against women as rulers, you know, that their their bodies would let them down. And I just think it's it's been a sort of misogynist view of Mary that's been that's pervaded and, and, and just keeps being repeated over and over again. Because um, certainly Shapwees, who the, the ambassador who knew her best, he never described her illnesses as um, uh, related to menstruation, even though he, you know, on, you know, he would talk about those sorts of things. He wasn't just sort of too polite to mention it. Mm. Um, so, and he knew her her better than any of the others. And the only one who mentions it is somebody who didn't actually know her. Right. So, yeah. So I would like to say, you know, it's not impossible, but I don't think that that's necessarily the root cause of her illness. And this, yeah, this I- misogynist idea that women's, you know, inferior wombs let them down is, is you know, hysterical. Even even women writers say that Mary was hysterical. Now, mm. hysteria in the 16th century meant that your womb wandered around your body. Right, okay. <laughs> so whatever was wrong with her, it wasn't her womb wandering <laughs> around her body. <laughs> <laughs> no. I, well, thank you for clarifying. I love a bit of myth busting. It's one of my favourite things. So, so thank you. Now, Melita, apart from research, you're writing books and all the other wonderful things you do. You're also, you mentioned you're the co-founder and editor of Tudor Times. So tell us a little bit about how this came to be and how you came to work with your partner on this. How, how does that work? Well, my, my partner, Deborah and I, we've, uh, my business partner, business uh, we've, yeah, we've been friends for many years and we used to work together uh, at, a, at a completely different sort of business many years ago. And, you know, we still bonded over a love of history. So we became friends and we went on a trip together to Scotland to have a look at some castles and, and what have you for some research I was doing for a book I was going to write, but, but never did in the end. Uh, and we were just talking about it and thought, oh, I wish there were a really good website that had all this information together. <laughs> so we said, okay, well, let's let's do it then. Yeah. So we got on the train to go home and we spent the whole train journey, you know, sketching out what it would be like. And that's what we created. So we look at Tudor and Stuart history from 1485 to 1625 and, you know, and bits that, that surround that. But what we're really interested in is... It's not just the individuals, mm-hmm. but what they, how they fitted together, and how politics in a wider sense worked. We, you're very interested in in the European aspect as well, rather than just you know so much of history um, in in um, England is is, is Anglo centric. Yes. Um, so we wanted to bring in this, the Scottish element. We also like to look at the European where we can. So it's. Yeah, no, we've loved doing it. Um, look, we talk about people, we talk about places, we talk about daily life, about military and warfare, about um, money, and and we also um, have lots of guest articles from uh, distinguished writers. And um, you know, we've, we're proud to have had works from you know Dr. Tracy Borman, from Alison Weir, from um, Linda Porter, and Leander. You know, some very very well known yeah. and respected historians have written guest articles for us yeah it's fantastic Um, fantastic resource (laughs) definitely i I recommend everyone checks it out now melita it's that time of the episode for us to play our little game to uh tend to go are you ready yeah (laughs) so what is uh your favorite or most inspirational place close to home so somewhere near you that you like to visit oh the bluebell wood oh bluebell wood that sounds really lovely (laughs) i'll have to look that one yes Love blue dust. So what's your strongest memory of your childhood? Or oh, a memory, if it's not the strongest. Yeah, no, no, I'm just, just thinking, is this thinking of my child? Gosh, um, <laughs> how funny. I, I'm, not, I'm not much of a looker-backer, really. Oh, I know, yes. Uh, when I was 10 years old, my parents got me a Siamese cat, which I had begged for. And, <laughs> oh, I loved that cat. She was, she was a, a Siamese cats are very companionable. Right. And she would follow me everywhere and, yes, oh, yeah, getting my that's, cat. <laughs> that's a lovely memory. Name something, apart from history, that you love and why do you love it? Gardening. Oh I God. love gardening and, well, just 
generally being outdoors actually but I, I i love gardening i love to feel the ground and to put something in it and a year later it's it's cr- turned into a, a thing of beauty yeah 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 gardening. definitely all right and this might answer the next question too i don't know what do you do to unwind and to relax i'm a great walker um yeah. i'm on a mission to walk around the coast of great britain Oh, lovely. That sounds fun. Yeah, so I have another blog which is tracking me around and I've just I've just finished five days in oh. West Wales in Pembrokeshire. So I've walked all the way from the Humber round to West Wales now. And when you're walking, it's, it's very therapeutic because everything, you know, you put your phone away, you turn every, all your wireless off and you're just with the sea on one side and um, you're just alone in nature and it's very, very therapeutic. And yeah. you see all sorts of weird and wonderful things and meet some interesting people you wouldn't normally meet and you go to lots of tea shops well that sounds just perfect i love that so what's one book that you're well, well that you're currently reading or that's on your tbr list i'm current well i'm currently doing a bit of research into anna cleaves who are okay. our next person of the month um what i i reread just recently which i still love watership down don't know if you've ever read it no i mean it's sort of a children's book but it was a, a film many years ago and a, a book but it's about it's about a bunch of rabbits okay <laughs> um, yeah but it's it's an absolute classic children's book watership oh. down well worth reading <laughs> i've just noted that down another book to look up um mm-hmm. is there something that most people don't know about you Possibly they don't know that I do that I'm doing my Great Britain walk. Um, yes, I I only found that out recently yeah. when we chatted earlier this year. So that that yes. so what was so the website for that, Melita? It's some weird press uh, oh, word, right. WordPress weird one. But if you look up Melita's coast Melita's uh, coast of Britain walk, you can find it. Melita's okay. coast of Britain. Walk. I'll find the link and I'll add it to the show notes. Right. So I don't know if you're much of a tea, TV watcher, but um, is there any show that you've binge watched, or maybe a movie that you watch kind of over and over and over again? Um, I used to love The Good Wife. Um, yes. Yeah, with um, whatever her name was. Yes, I used to love that. Um, mm-hmm. At the moment, um, I'm watching Harrow because I just love Johan Griffith. Oh, okay. <laughs> as a as a good Welsh woman, I, I, quite apart from him, um, he has been very easy on the eye. Yes. <laughs> All right, great. So, what do you have a favourite portrayal of Mary the First in film? Uh, no, because they're all so dreadful. They're, yeah, they're not like the fun lady that you just described. No, no. I suppose uh, Jane Lapoter wasn't too bad in Lady Jane. Was it Lady Jane? Oh, um, okay. Yeah, but generally, um, generally, generally, it's all it's all too depressing. <laughs> it is a little. I know what you mean. Okay, describe a day in your life when you're writing. Do you follow any particular rituals at all? Uh, not rituals, no. Um, because I suppose my career generally has been very structured around writing reports and sort of self-discipline so I just you know sit down and I and I, and I write right. uh, I nearly always write at my desk which unfortunately is rather untidy <laughs> which is why we're not on film um, it's it, the more I do in the morning the better I'm, I'm definitely a morning person so no no particular rituals I can um it, the, the thing to do is just keep writing, um, even if it's rubbish, because you can always get rid of it later. Just yeah. write anything down. So true. All right. And lucky last, what superpower would you like to have and why? Um, oh, can I go back in time and undo a few mistakes? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, that could be a superpower. Could be, that would be yeah, a very popular yeah. superpower. Uh, what, so, yeah. Uh, I don't know, really. I'm... I'm yeah. No, I, I, I'll, do. I'll, I like I'll, that I'll one. a few words I wish I, I could unset. That's it. If you if you could take that oh, word. Yes. <laughs> Wouldn't that be handy? That would be, I think we all need a bit of that. And very last thing is our Tudor takeaway, which is just something for us to explore after the episode. Do you have a Tudor takeaway for us? Uh, there is one site that's absolutely excellent. I don't know if everybody knows about it. It's, mm-hmm. uh, it's the Internet Archive. Internet. And I think it's just www.archive.org. Yes. And yeah, it's, a, have you come across it? It's it's I basically have, yeah. a, a li- a, an online library, but there's all sorts of books, obscure books that have been digitized from libraries here, there. And you can find, you know, books that have been out of print for years on the most obscure topics. I mean, I just found a whole load of stuff about, because I've been writing about St. David's Cathedral for, for Tudor times. And there's a whole load of 19th century histories of it, which, you know, you'd never find in a library That's right. so yeah have a look at internet archive all sorts of things on there 
That's brilliant. And we should maybe warn everyone, I've lost hours of my life browsing things on the <laughs> internet <laughs> archive. So just be warned if you go on there, yeah, prepare to lose a few hours. <laughs> now, before, before we go, I just realized I didn't ask you about your new book. So can you tell us about that? Yes, uh, it's called The House of Grey, Friends and oh. Foes of Kings. Now, uh, it's not about Lady Jane, bless okay. her. I mean, she pops up, but lots of people have done her. Yes. But one of the things I discovered as I wrote about Mary was how close the Tudors were to their grey cousins. Uh, so this is the son of Elizabeth Woodville by her first marriage, her sons, Thomas and oh. Richard. And so the book is about um, Thomas Marcus of Dorset, his son the second marcus of dorset who was very close to henry the mm -hmm. all of their siblings uh thomas the first's wife the marvelous cecily bonville who was the richest girl in england and oh, yes. horrified her children when she married a man 20 years younger <laughs> when she was widowed <laughs> so you could see them all seeing their inheritance fading away and then the third in the row uh, henry duke of suffolk jane's father you know, what made him do it? What made him think it was a good plan? Right. So that comes out. It's gone off to the publishers. It comes out on September the 15th. Oh, and lovely. And it's now available for pre-order. Oh, fantastic. That sounds, I'm going to go and have a look at that. That sounds really fantastic. Melita, we've come to the end. Thank you so much. It's been so wonderful chatting with you. And I appreciate you waking up nice and early to speak with me before your day begins. So thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for listening. If you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you will also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family and click on the all important follow button so you'll never miss an episode. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind the scenes news. It's time now for us to re-enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. Mm -hmm.